The word pride. The mm. word pride. Okay? Turn to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs <coughs> 16. I'm always asking these trick questions. Brother Wayne never asks my questions. I can tell. He's all the time looking. He, there's a trick to this question. I feel like Brother Wayne, uh, if I just be open with y'all, Brother Wayne looks like he's always still trying to figure me out. Uh, he's shaking his head, yeah. He's still trying to figure me out. See, don't worry. My wife's still trying to figure me out. Yeah. And we've been married for 25 years, so. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk about pride tonight. Right. We're going to do a word study. Uh, about uh, the word pride. And what I'm trying to get across is certainly I'm going to teach you about the word pride, but I want to hopefully teach you how to do a word study because if you want to study the Bible, if you want to be a student of God's Word, and I hope that you do, because the Bible commands us to study. Amen. Commands us to study. Just not preachers. Just not evangelists or missionaries. Not just Sunday school teachers. Everybody ought to be studying the Word of God. Uh, that is a uh, born again believer, and so I want to hopefully give you uh, tonight, and might do it again to show, make sure you get it, <coughs> to show you how to do a word study, and you're gonna need some tools to do so. But tonight we're gonna talk about the word <coughs> pride. In Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Says, I'm just gonna read this one verse. It says, "Pride goeth before destruction." And a haughty spirit before fall. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Okay, you can have a seat. That's all I'm going to read. Now, let me ask you another question. Here's another one of the questions. Well, Darren's looking at me strange too. <laughs> is, it, is it a sin to be proud of your country? My question. What about, is it a sin to be proud of your children? You see these bumper stickers on people's cars. I'm a proud parent of a kid, or my kid goes to this, and I'm a proud parent. Is it a sin to be proud of your kid? Mm. I want to answer that question. Well, we'll answer it in the message, since you don't want to answer it. I figured I'd have to ask, ask the first questions about the fact you wouldn't want to answer that one. So we'll uh, wait and let the message define it for us, or the Word of God, and not just what I think. If you're going to if you're going to study the Bible, okay, you're going to need some tools as a student of God's Word. Okay, first of all, you need a King James Bible. But other than a King James Bible, you need an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Now you can get it very reasonable online, or you can buy one. But you need to get a good dictionary that has been settled, has been written by a Christian man, and it uses the Bible to define the words. Okay? And that is so in an 1828 Webster <coughs> Dictionary. I have one on my desk. We eventually go have a library here, and we'll have two or three of them in the library so that you can check them out and use them. But... You need a dictionary that does not change words. Just like, how many of you parents like the idea that they change our history books? They rewrite our history books. Right. I don't right. like that. Right. I don't like the idea that people have rewritten the Word of God. Right. And I don't like the idea they rewrite our dictionaries. Right. And that's what they've done. They've given words new meanings. Right. And they don't mean what they used to mean no more. That's why I like going back to an old one. Um, that um, uses the King James as its base. It uses it as its base. And so that's a good reason why you ought to use it. If you're going to be a student of God's Word and you're going to study the Word of God, now I encourage you as um, teachers and if you're called to preach or if you have any desire to study God's Word, you need to get you an 1828 Webster Dictionary. Okay? And uh, if you'll let me know, I'll be on the lookout for them, and I certainly am. If I ever find um, some that's used, I'll pick them up, and then uh, uh, whatever they cost be a good deal compared to what it is new. I think brand new, you can get them for 55 bucks. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty expensive, but they're about this thick. Mm -hmm. But it, um, if we can get one used or something, probably get it for 20 bucks or so, and um, we'll keep an eye out for that. But anyway, 
You need a good dictionary that will help you understand words. There are a lot of words in the King James Bible that you're just not going to understand. Okay? The word agu. That is not that guy on TV or that agu. A G U E. If I know, want to take a guess at what that means? It's in your Bible. And if you were to run across it reading it, you'd probably just skip it. <coughs> That's what I would do. Okay? Right? That's what you be honest. Right. That's what you do. That's what I do. You just act. I'd be up here, and if I ran across it, and I, I'd just act like I was real spiritual and knew exactly what I meant. Keep going. That's what preachers do. Anytime you have you ever? Let me ask you this: Have you ever been sitting in? And we're kind of teaching tonight and talking, so just talk with me and bear with me. Have you ever sat in a, in a preaching or a fellowship or a Bible conference and and, you, and they say turn to a certain scripture? You say, oh man, they're going to talk about this verse. And I always want to know what this word means. And they run right over it. I say, man, why didn't they tell me what that word meant? <laughs> right. Am I the only one that's ever done that? Raise your hand. Anybody ever? Okay. Several people. That's me, I think. And then we get home, me and Beth look at each other. And I say, did you think they was going to define that word or give you some inclination of what it meant? Yeah. And they didn't do it. I said, well, man, that's what I thought. I thought, sure, that was going to be able to help me with that word. A good, by the way. I've written today, doing study, <coughs> and I ran across that word. I said, what in the world is that? So I pulled out my Webster, 1828. And it means a shaking or a shivering of the eye. It's kind of like a chill, it said, that you get before you get a fever. God was talking about Israel and that he was going to punish Israel and that he was going to uh, cause her eye to shiver. Right? So that's what it means. Doing the word study tonight. Anyway, the word pride. Three things that I want to talk about concerning pride. And again, it's, it's not so much I'm trying to teach you about pride tonight, but I'm trying to teach you, I am trying to teach you about pride. But I'm trying to teach you about a word study. Okay? There's three things that I normally look for when I do a word study on any word. You might say, well, I know what most of the words means. Sure you do. Sure you do. Just like I do. Uh, you think you know, but when you look it up sometimes, it sheds light on the word. Then you say, wow, I didn't know that. And it helps you to better understand the meaning of the word if you put it in its context. <coughs> now, the first thing I normally look at is the mention in Scripture, the mention of the word. Whatever word I'm studying, what be pride or blood or cross or Jesus or, 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 or Godhead or, or whatever I'm studying, I want to look at the mention in Scripture. Well, this particular word, pride, and um, the other forms of pride, like being proud, is found 97 times in Scripture. 97 times in Scripture. <coughs> and the first thing I look at uh, after I find out how many times it's found in Scripture is I want to look at the first mention in the Bible. The first mention. It's very important that you look at the first mention of a word. If you're studying the word in the Bible, you want to know what does God, the first time he mentions this word, what does he say about it? What does he say about it? Just like the last words that Jesus said before he left the earth. You know where that's found, right? It's very important. Acts 1, chapter 1 there. Right. Well, the first mention of the word pride is found in Leviticus chapter 26. So turn over to Leviticus chapter 26. We want to see what God says the very first time he mentions the word pride. Now, I don't know if you write in your Bible, but you should write in your Bible. Okay? That's not adding to the word of God. It's not taken away from the word of God. It's not changing. I didn't say scratch anything out and, and put your own words there. But right in the margin of your Bible, I have a wide margin Bible where I can write notes. And what I do when I find the first mention of the word, I write beside it, first mention of the word pride. And I do that with blood, redemption, salvation, hell, and so forth. Holy. Does anybody know the first thing that God calls holy in the Bible? The very first thing? The ground. Holy ground. Holy ground. The first mention of the word pride is mentioned here in Leviticus 26, 
26, verse 19. Okay? And this is the Lord, again, uh, talking to Israel, and he says in verse 19, And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as, uh, as brass. And what you learn from that is something that will carry throughout Scripture. <clears throat> you will find that normally the first mention of the word, the definition, that definition most of the time will carry all the way through Scripture. And it's true with this word as well. Pride follows power. Pride follows power. You watch people in the Bible many times who were put in a position and pride followed them. Amen. And they fell because of pride. It also shows that pride needs to be broken. And you'll see that throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture, you'll see that. You'll see that pride that God uh, broke Nebuchadnezzar and God would break different men who had pride in their lives. It had to be broken. Amen. The Bible talks about that. So that's the first mention in the Bible. Another thing that I normally do is I look at the first mention in the New Testament. Sometimes I look at the second mention in the Bible. Uh, but for sake of time, we're going to go to the New Testament. Turn over to the book of Mark, chapter 7. Again, what we're doing tonight is a word study on the word pride. To help show you what you need to do in studying the word of God. Because one of the things you'll need to do in studying is that you'll need to look up words and find out what the Bible says about that word. In Mark 7, verse 20, I'm going to read a couple of verses, uh, through, uh, verse 20 through 23. And this is, let me tell you the backdrop of this, the context, context, context is very important when you're uh, studying. So you don't take something out of context. Uh, the disciples were walking through and they were picking up bread and just eating. Well, the Pharisees and all these people got all up in the air about it because the tradition was that you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat anything and blah, 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 blah. And they was all up in the air about the traditions of men. And Jesus sat down and told them a parable and, and talked with them. Now the disciples, they can't figure out what the world Jesus is talking about. And so Jesus is going to explain it to them. In verse 20, And he said to my Jesus, That which cometh out of the man... That defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, <coughs> adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. God's, God, what Jesus is here, he's trying to teach the disciples saying, it's not what you put in man that will defile a man. Right. Because that's going to come through your system and you're going to be flushed of that. Comes through the drought, the Bible says. And so therefore your system is flushed with that stuff. That's not what defiles a man. It's what comes from the inside, from the heart, that comes out of man, that defiles a man. And he has a list here. A list here of things that come from the heart of man. They're evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness. There's one in words. Does anybody want to guess what that means? One in big words that nobody ever defines? No. It's all kind of sexual sins. It's all kind of sexual sins, even sex, bestiality. Bestiality, which is sex with animals. It can include um, sodomite. There's all types of perversions of sexual sins. That's what it is. An evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. So pride comes from within the heart, Jesus is telling his disciples. And pride defiles a person, along with these other things. Now, another thing I always do is I look at the last mention in the Bible. Just like 
I was talking about one ago. What's the last time that Jesus spoke? Well, those are very important words. You think if Jesus was the last time he was going to speak to somebody, it would be very important what he's fixing to say. So we're going to look at the last time pride is used. It's found in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 in verse 16. And you should probably know this by heart. Or you should. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is how Satan came at Eve in the garden. Amen. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Amen. Same way that he came to attempt Jesus, same way. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know how it comes to you? Same way. Lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of life. Those are it. Those three ways. That's the only three ways that he's going to come at you. And it says here that pride is one of the three ways in which we are tempted. That's what it teaches you. Pride is of the world, and pride is not of the Father. Right. It's not of God the Father. Now, we're going to look at some verses here that just make honorable mention. Is what I call honorable mention. Turn back over to Job. Job chapter 41. Job chapter 41. And this is the greatest chapter. If you want to learn something about Satan, this is it. The greatest chapter on Satan. Found in Job chapter 41. It's not Ezekiel 28. It's not Isaiah chapter 14. It is Job chapter 41. Every verse is talking about him. Verse 1, it says, Canst thou draw out Levithan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Now your scholars and your commentaries will tell you, oh, that's a great whale. It's not a great whale. And it's not a crocodile either, by the way. Right. Okay? This is Satan. That's who it's talking about. It's talking about the devil. <laughs> and we're talking about pride, so go down to verse 34. The last verse, I mean the last, yeah, the last verse of chapter 41. <laughs> Says he, he who? The devil, Satan. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. And who better? Why was Satan thrown out of... Uh, why was um, um, Lu uh, um, <coughs> Lucifer thrown out of heaven? Because of pride. I, right. I, I. right. Yeah. That's what he said. He is a king over all the children of pride. Pride comes from Satan. Psalms 119, verse 21. Psalms 119, verse 21. David said, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. You see here that the proud have a curse on them. Turn over to Proverbs 8.13. Proverbs 8.13. Kind of going in a hurry now. <coughs> Proverbs 8, 13. <coughs> it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So, hey, I didn't think we're supposed to hate. We're supposed to love everybody. We're not supposed to love evil. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. That's what it says. We're God hates pride. We're supposed to hate pride. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Proverbs 16, verse 5. It says, Everyone that is proud in heart, notice what it says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Mm. Mm. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So, so we cast all the stones we want at who? Sodomites, but you know what? Better be careful with the stones you cast. You're just an abomination to just like if you have pride. Right. What it says, and everybody in here within the last 20 years, I guarantee you've had pride. Probably one. Yeah. At least one. So God says, when you had pride, or when you have pride now, then God says you are an abomination to the Lord. That's what it says. I didn't say it. That's what the Scripture says. 
So we've seen the mention in Scripture, which is good to know so that you can begin to get a handle on what God thinks. His first mention in the Bible, the first mention in the New Testament, the last time it's mentioned in the Word of God, and then sometimes I write down some honorable mention that really stand out to me. And what that does is kind of get you understanding what God says about a word that you're saying. Right. Whether it be pride, blood, death, or whatever. So, so far we've seen a lot of different things about pride. Obviously, it's not a good thing. Right. It's not something we should have. It's right. not something that we should be, uh, be using. It's not something that God uh, loves. It's something that God hates because He says it is an abomination. Now, let's look at the meaning the meaning of the word. But first, I'm going to give you the meaning of, of, a, of it found in the 1828 dictionary. It says, It is an ordinate, ordinate self-esteem and unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty. That means women can have it. It's like, ooh, I'm better looking than them. Wealth, accomplishments, rank or elevation in office, which manifests itself self in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. Hmm. That's what the dictionary, 1828, says that pride is. And that's a pretty long definition. Now let's look and see what God <clears throat> says in the words that it uses to describe the word pride. Psalms 101, verse 5. Now what I did today, <coughs> you can do all on your own, in your own study, in your own home, and could have come to the same conclusions. In Psalms 101, verse 5, the first definition that God gives pride is a high look. It says, who so privily that means privately, slandereth his neighbor. Him will I cut off, him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Most of the time, the King James Bible would define it itself within the context, which is good. A high look, that's what pride is, looking high, thinking I'm better than you, with your nose stuck up in the air. I've seen some people have so much pride with no stuck in there. They're running and they're drowning. <laughs> right. You know, you've seen the same thing. The second one, Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18. The second definition. is a haughty spirit. Not only has it a high look, but it has a haughty spirit which comes from the inside. Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goeth before destruction. This is the verses we read. And a haughty spirit before fall. They go hand in hand. You find a person that has pride in their heart and it's coming out. They got that little walk about them and they're better than you. You mark it down. They got that spirit inside of them. They got a haughty spirit inside of them. And it's not the Holy Spirit either. Right. Not only that, in Isaiah 2.12. Isaiah 2.12. Has a high look. A haughty spirit and is lofty and lifted up. Haughty, I'm sorry, lofty and lifted up. Isaiah 2 12. <coughs> it says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. God makes a promise there that he's going to bring that proud person down. He's going to break that rod of uh, pride that that person has. But again, the Bible defines it as high look, a haughty spirit, someone that is lofty and lifted up above what they should be. There's nothing wrong with having a, uh, a sense of um, you, you shouldn't walk around depressed all the time saying, well, I'm nobody, I can't do anything, and I'm just going to sit down and die. That's not, that's not humility either, by the way. <laughs> and that's not uh, uh, healthy. But you can have, <coughs> I don't say too much, you don't need to have any, 
But we don't need to look at ourselves as if we're nothing, but we don't need to look at ourselves as we're better than others. Pride. Another definition is found in Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, verse 11. Isaiah 13, 11. We've seen the high look, a haughty spirit. It's lofty and lifted up, and then it's arrogant. And I will punish the world for their evil, the Lord says, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Boy, don't we see that in America? Mm -hmm. Our politicians. They stick their finger up at God and they shake their fist and they take him out of the courtroom. They take him and we won't pray and they take him out of the United Nations. You know what? That's haughtiness. Being high and lifted, that's arrogance. And God says, I'm going to break that spirit. Right. I'm going to take care of that. And he will. But that's the definition of pride found in the Bible. It's a high look. It's a haughty spirit. It's lofty and lifted up and it's arrogant. It's arrogancy. Now, what is the message? We've seen the mention. We've seen the meaning. Now, look at the message. The message that I have found is <coughs> 97 times. And I looked at each of them today about three times. I read every verse three times. <clears throat> what is the message that God is trying to get across about the word pride? <coughs> Well, pride is never used in Scripture in a positive way. All 97 times, there's not one exception, is it ever used in a good way. It's always a bad, sinful, negative way. It's always spoken of as sin. And therefore, it's always going to be dealt with by God. Right. Pride should never be used in describing our feelings. And pride is sinful, so we should never use the word, in my opinion. I believe that's the message that is trying to get across. So go back to our original questions. Is it a sin to be proud of your country? You've, you hear people say, I'm proud to be an American. That, that song says, I'm proud to be an American. <coughs> is it wrong to sing that? Is it wrong to say, I'm proud to be an American? I'll be honest with you, this day and time, there ain't a whole lot to be proud about being American. Right. But be, first off, I'd rather be an American than about anything else. Right. It's still the greatest country in all the world. Right. And I thank God that I was born here. I thank God that it, I am an American. I thank God that God put me here, and I had the opportunity as a young boy <coughs> to be raised in a Christian home with my mom and dad to take me to church Amen. and have a Bible. And, I could, and we could go worship the way whatever we choose to. And I thank God for that. But should we ever call our, should we ever say that we're proud of our kids? I'm going to say no right. because of what I've just shared with you. I believe that Scripture tells us what we should say. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And I understand what people mean you know, when they say, I'm proud of being American. Or, I'm proud of my honor student. You know, they made straight A's. But I would jump on them for that. <coughs> I'd use some kind of discretion, and you should too. should jump on somebody, because I don't necessarily think they mean it in the sense that maybe we know, it, know that it to be true. But this is, in my opinion... The words we ought to use and the words that I try my best to use. Occasionally you may hear me slip up and use the word pride, but I try not to. Matthew 3, 17. And this is that when Jesus was, well, let's read verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning, alighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I believe that's the phrase that personally uh, that we ought to use as Christians. You, you shouldn't say that I'm proud of my kids. I think you ought to say, I'm pleased with my kids. Right. Or I'm pleased to be an American. Or I'm pleased with this. I think to be biblical. Those, that is the biblical word. The phrase well pleased is used nine times in Scripture. 
And every time but once it is used by God in a positive way. There is one time it's not used in a positive way. In fact, it says that God is not pleased with someone. But five of those times is spoken by God about His Son. Five of those times. And I guess in the sense that we mean it, if anybody <laughs> were to ever say, I'm proud of my son, certainly God would have been the one in the sense that we mean it sometimes, that God would be the one to say, I have a reason to be proud of my son in, 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 in our sense. Certainly we know better because pride is a sin and therefore God would not use that. That's why he uses, I am well pleased. I believe that's the words that we ought to use. Now, now I've showed you a little bit about pride. I've showed you the, the mention of it in Scripture. I've showed you the meaning from Scripture. And I showed you, I believe, the message in Scripture, what it's trying to do. Now, I've given you a basic, very basic. I did not pick a word that had hundreds and thousands of uses, okay? It took me seven hours to do this. Seven hours. I spent seven hours a day doing this. You say, oh, that was simple. Well, if you take all 97 verses and you read them and you look them up three times and you read them and you go and you study and you look up the words and you read cross-references and, 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 and look at commentaries and you look at the scripture and then it will take you seven, seven hours too, I'm sure. Right. Okay? So, that's how much time I spent on this. Now, I say that not to scare you to death, but to show you that Bible study is work. Right. You know, you can say, oh yeah, I want to study the Scripture. But do you? Studying is hard work. Right. It's labor. It's tiring. But it takes time. But I can tell you the fruit from it. I can tell you the things I gained from it was a blessing. Man. And it far outweighed the time. It far outweighed the time that I invested. Because I'm investing in God's Word. I'm Man. investing in my spiritual growth. I'm, I'm investing in this church. I'm investing in your lives to try to teach you how to study. Because see, as a newborn Christian, <coughs> and I realize some of you are not newborn Christians, but even as an, an older Christian, you don't want to be spoon-fed all your whole life. Right. You know, I don't want my wife, wife saying, open up now, let me give you your, your steak. Open up, open up. You know, well, you as a Christian, you should say, hey, I, I want to feed myself. I want to, I want to dig in that book and see what God's got for me. Right, man. <laughs> and, and, and even though you might get a lot out of what I just did, you might say, well, you know, I got some words that you know, I like to study. And that's the way you should do it. You should say, hey, I think I'm going to go home. I'm going to do me a word study. And you can do the same thing. And it will be beneficial to your spiritual growth. It will help you. It, God will call those things to my remembrance yeah, amen. when I need them. So I say, hey, I remember doing a word to tell you on that one time. And I'll use that in other messages. I'll use it in the future. But I encourage you, as a Christian, if you're going to grow, you got to be in this book. Right. Amen. That's our, that, that's our food. And unless we get in there and study and read, we're not going to grow. You say, well, I just want to come to church and I just want you to feed me. That's your job. And it is. The Bible does say I'm supposed to feed you. You're right. And I'll do my best to do that. I'll try to feed you. I'll preach to you. I'll teach to you. That's what I'm supposed to do. But it also says study. And that's to you. Right. I'm supposed to study and feed you. And teach to you. But you're supposed to also study. You know why? To make sure I'm teaching you the Bible. Right. right. What if I'm telling you something wrong? You're supposed to know. You're supposed to know. If, 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 I, if your pastor is teaching you something that's not biblical. Or anybody else who stands up there. <coughs> well, I hope that you'll take this basic work study. Remember, and I may do another one to hopefully help you grasp some things about studying the Bible.
I'm going to start, I don't know if it's going to be next Wednesday, but I'm going to start and I'm going to give you some things, some tools to help you rightly divide the word of truth. One of them is doing a word study. If you can't do word studies, then you're going to come across words and you're going to just skip over it and you're going to forget it. But you need to know the definition of those words. If you don't know the definition of those words, then you can't understand what God's trying to teach you. So, word pride. So, my original question. Should we be proud of being American? No. Should we be proud of our kids? No. Can't be proud of you, Tim. Sorry. Can't be proud of you, ain't John, can't be proud of John. We should be pleased. We should be pleased. <coughs> when they're pleasing. Right. Only when they're pleasing. Them. Right. That's the catch. When they're pleasing. <laughs> Gotta be pleasing. And we're still kids too. I got a mom and dad, and I, I want to be pleasing to them. As, as a, uh, I'm 46, and I still like for my dad to tell me I'm pleased. Would you? I still like that. Right. He's uh, 69 years old, and I still like my dad to say, "Mark, I'm real pleased with you." That's the way any, any, any little boy is. Or a little girl likes to hear the mom, and so forth. And so, I tell you, the best thing is when we get to heaven, and the Lord says, well done. Right, man. Good and faithful servant. Man. That's going to be worth it all. Man. It'll be worth all the time you spent work studying, I promise you. Because those things that come back to you when you knock on doors, and somebody wants to talk to you about something. Right. And God will bring back those word studies. I guarantee you, brother. Brian. You do those word studies, the Lord will bring those things back to you and help you. When you're knocking on doors, you're talking to people, and you'll think you forgot about it, it'll be six months from now. And somebody asks you something about it, or something will lead to it, and you'll say, man, I, I remember all that. And it'll be a blessing to you. Right, man. Well, Brother John, you mind closing us some word prayer, please? Lord, I want to thank you for the message you, we've heard tonight, Lord. Help us to get into the Bible and study it like we should. Lord, pray for these leaders, Lord, that's over us, Lord. That help them too, Lord. That they have no, no respect for the Bible or no respect for nobody but themselves. And Lord, as we go through this day and this, this afternoon and tomorrow, watch over us, Lord, and help us and guide us and Direct us as we should go and what we should do. We just thank you for all this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.